so taking the initiative started by zoological start society of assam to bring online educational resources to the students uh, today i am going to discuss about the basic concepts of wildlife conservation and management uh, especially i like to dedicate this present presentation to our most respected teacher professor p c bhattacharjee sir he was former hod department of zoology guwahati university uh, but much much more than that he was the person who brought in the ecology special paper in guwahati university and is today like a father figure to all the bud budding ecologists and wildlife specialists in northeast india so let us get into the subject the term conservation was coined by the forester gifford pinchot in 1907 fine and it was to describe the philosophy that environment must be managed to assure adequate supplies of natural resources for the present and the future generation fine so when we are talking of the present and future generation uh, this concept is today known as the concept of sustainable development so it has its origin way way back in the year 1907 when gifford pinchot described the philosophy that and the environment must be managed to ensure the adequate supplies the term is derived from the latin word conservare which means to save or to preserve or to watch over or to guard fine that is all what we do when we talk of about talk about wildlife conservation we try to save the animals we try to preserve them for the future generations we watch over them we guard them against poaching and so on wildlife <coughs> we know is today under threat worldwide as a result of various activities of man like the destruction and modification of wildlife habitats so that is one of the basic issues which is putting the wildlife and biodiversity in threat under threat throughout the world then there are other issues also like over exploitation of wildlife trade of wildlife etc to counter the threat of possible extinction now if wildlife are threatened uh the ultimate outcome may be that most of the animals that we have today they might go extinct the extinction rate is already much much higher than the background extinction rate uh, which we find in the geological history so we already are in the midst of an mass extinction which is going on on the planet earth and to stop this and to check this the conservation and management of wildlife have become so very essential <clears throat> now let us look into one of the definitions of wildlife i'll take up the definition given by billy and he says that wildlife is a social process encompassing both lay and professional activities that define to seek and to attain wise use of wildlife resources and maintain the productivities of wildlife habitat so this is one of the best definitions i have come across which describes the process of wildlife conservation in ultimate details now what we are going to do is that we are going to have a closer look into the definition so wildlife conservation 
it is a social process. When we say it is a social process, what we mean to say is that each and every person in the society has got a role to play in the process of wildlife conservation. Now, this has been realized by governments all over the world today. Suppose if you happen to ask your parents as to when they were in their schools, did they have the chapter of environment in the syllabus? Most of the time the answer will come no. Fine. Yet today, right from the school, the concept of environment and ecology is introduced so that it goes up to the MSc level, goes at up to the PG level and beyond. So why is this done? Say even UGC has made the study of environment compulsory for art, science and commerce students. The issue is that unless and until each and every person is made aware about the necessity of conservation, the process of conservation can, cannot, cannot, be, cannot be achieved or it cannot be made fruitful, fine? So we are going to discuss about the social process in one of the later slides in more details. Now encompassing, that is what does it include? It includes both lay and professional activities. Layman activity, what does it mean? Suppose uh, rhinos are getting poached in Kaziranga, fine. They are the target of poachers, you ask, any person, any common man as to what we need to do in order to stop poaching and apt will come the answer that is we need to increase the guards, total number of guards, we need to equip our guards with the latest equipments, we need to equip our guard with, uh, uh, with facilities so that they can move around within the national park, say one side of Kaziranga National Park is the Brahmaputra River, so they need motor boats in order to man the Brahmaputra side of the Kaziranga National Park and so on. So these are issues which even a lay person can talk about. But then there are certain professional activities also and that is what we are going to discuss in details. That define to seek and to attain. That is what does it aim to do? What is the ultimate aim of wildlife conservation? The social process that we are talking of. Well, it is the wise use of wildlife resources and maintain the productivities of wildlife habitats. So we need to ensure that we have a, a sustainable wildlife population within the reserves and if we need to have that, wildlife always will be conserved in the wildlife habitats. It cannot be conserved in vacuum. So basically, if the productivity of the wildlife habitats is maintained, then only will we have the appropriate wildlife resources that we are aiming for and only then will we be able to use them for our benefit. For our benefit doesn't mean that we need to go and kill them. No, that's not it. That is not what I am trying to say. Say, if we have enough of the wildlife, then definitely the ecosystems are getting conserved within the protected areas, the areas are open to uh, tourism from where we can earn a substantial amount of revenue and so on. So basically, let me repeat it, social process, including both layman and professional activities, defined to seek and to attain, but what do we try to achieve? We try to achieve a viable wildlife population, which is maintained in a productive wildlife habitat. So we need to conserve the animals in their original habitats as far as possible. Now, as for the professional activities, say I'll take up the case study of rhinoceros, fine, in order to explain what sort of professional activities may be necessary to, to conserve and to manage wildlife. So if we talk of rhinoceros, there are five species of rhinos throughout the world. We have the black rhino, Diceros bicornis, white rhino, Cerethrium simum, Javan rhino, Rhinoceros sondigus, great Indian one-horned rhino, Rhinoceros unicornis, Sumatran rhino, Di 
zero rhinus sumatrensis. Now the first two, that is the black rhino and white rhino, written in blue, the names written in blue, they are the African species. The lower three, that is the Javan rhino, great one horned rhino, and Sumatran rhino, are the species which are prevalent in or found in Asia. Now, interestingly, while both of the African species they have two horns, of the Asian species, two have distinguishing one horn, whereas the Sumatran rhino it has two horns. Fine, Sumatran rhino found in Borneo and Sumatra, it has two horns. What is more interesting, if we look into the habitat, say black rhino, grasslands, fine, white rhino, grassy plains, one-horned rhino, alluvial grasslands. Javan rhino, it is found in dense rainforests. Sumatran rhino, forests with thick vegetation. So, I am basically going to concentrate upon find the relationship between the grasslands in uh, grasslands uh, which are used by great one-horned rhino for its survival that is the habitat of great one-horned rhino uh, and how they are managed how they have been managed professionally to ensure the survival of great one-horned rhino uh, please mind it that there is a little bit, not a little bit, there is a bit of difference in the grasslands that we find uh, within, within Northeast India and the grasslands which are there in Africa. So, the grasslands of Africa, they are basically in a climax state. And for the, for the moment, just remember the term climax state, whereas the grasslands which are there in Assam, they are not in the climax state and there that is where the management issue comes in fine so uh, let us look into before going further let us look into the distribution of great one horned rhino so within assam it is found in kaziranga national park laukwa we are still trying to reintroduce it fine uh, there were many present at time at one time but due to social unrest the population was wiped out. We have it in Pobitora Wildlife Sanctuary. We have uh, Rhinoceros unicorn is in Urang Wildlife Sanctuary, and they again are being reintroduced in Manas. Now, they are not the sole denizens of Assam. Outside Assam, Assam within India, they are found in Jaldapara and Gurumora National Park in West Bengal and Katari. Katari Nia Ghat Wildlife Sanctuary and Dudhwa National Park in UP. Interestingly, they are also found outside India and they are found in four nature reserves in Nepal. So this is about the distribution of, uh, overall distribution of greater Indian one-horned rhinoceros, rhinoceros unicornis. Next, I'll go down particularly to Kaziranga National Park. Now, Kaziranga, it was declared as a reserve forest in 1908. Interestingly, at that time, only 12 rhinos were left out in Kaziranga. Kaziranga was declared as a national park in 1974. According to the 2018 census, today we have 2,413 rhinos in Kaziranga National Park. So this is 110 years of conservation history. Fine. We do not get such parallel anywhere else in the world, such success anywhere else in the world of in situ conservation of a particular animal. From 12 rhinos, today we are talking of 2,413 rhinos in Kaziranga National Park alone. So the issue is that Say, even though rhinoceros is found, say, outside Assam or maybe outside, outside India also, why is it that people are so attracted to Kaziranga National Park? Fine. There are two basic issues. One is that Kaziranga holds 80% of the rhino population of the world. That is point number one. And it is a place where we find the, find the big five animals. 
Now, this has been made possible. This has been made possible how? By burning, controlled burning of the grasslands. It is a very, very old practice, and it has it is believed that it, it has been practiced for almost a century now. Find burning, controlled burning of the grasslands every year. Every year in around the end of January, the grasslands they become more or less dry. And it is after that the forest trough they practice controlled burning of the grassland. Now, why is it done? It is done to arrest the process of succession. It is done to arrest the process of succession so that succession doesn't take place. What is it? We are coming to it in the next slide. <coughs> so we keep the definition intact. And what is succession? Succession basically is the replacement of one ecological community by another ecological community at the same place over a period of time until a final community comes in place which stabilizes with the prevailing environmental conditions of the area. Fine. So we are having the same place, same area that we are talking of and initially we have a community which comes and establishes and that is known as the pioneer community and that will be replaced by a second community that may be by a third and ultimately a final community comes in place which is known as the climax community and this community stabilizes with the prevailing environmental conditions of the area. Say for example, if we start with their land, nothing is there. Fine, this is a simple example. It, uh, the first that may come are the grasses. They will be replaced maybe by herbs. Fine, uh, perennial plants and herbs. They may be replaced by shrubs. They will be replaced by shrubs and ultimately by trees. Fine, now the problem with rhinoceros unicorn is, is that the issue with rhinoceros unicorn is, is that it is a denizen. That is, the grasslands are the habitat of grasslands are the habitat of rhinoceros unicornis. Fine. And the grasslands, the alluvial, alluvial grasslands of northeast India, they are the habitat of rhinoceros unicornis. And these grasslands are not in the climax state. These grasslands are not in the climax state. If we if we compare if we refer to the grasslands which are present in Africa, fine, those grasslands are in the climate state, that is, they are not going to change into anything else. But if we do not burn the grasslands out here, slowly, over a period of time, the grasslands will be totally wiped out, and what we will get is a forest land. And Rhinoceros unicornis, as such, does not survive in forest land. It visits forest land, but it basically needs grasslands to survive. So, uh, this sentence has been taken from the government of Assam Forest Department website as to why is the why is the burning carried out? To facilitate growth of new palatable sprout. Fine. Uh, after, after we burn the grasslands, the new grasses which come out are quite palatable to a variety of animals and arrest succession of woody species. We do not want the woody species or woodlands to invade the grasslands. Fine. For that reason, grasslands are burned in a planned and predetermined manner. So this is the controlled burning of grassland. Now comes the issue that how are we going to burn the grasslands? Fine. So that the other animals are not affected. When are we going to burn the grasslands? Fine. Which are the areas in which we will burn the grasslands? Now, these are issues that cannot be decided by a layman. So, these are, this is an example of professional activity of wildlife conservation. Fine. So, social process. Now, we are going to look into the fact as to when we say that Wildlife conservation is a social process. Fine. 
what do we really mean by it? Now, uh, this concept again has been given by Delhi, and in trying to explain the process of wildlife conservation as a social process, he found it appropriate to divide the society into three sectors. One is the scientific sector, second is the social sector, that is the general public at large, and third is the management sector, that is the forest department people. Now we are going to look into the activities of each sector in details. So scientific sector, so what is carried out is wildlife research, research on wildlife and biodiversity, fine. What issues are we interested in? It in involves study of animal properties, fine. What are the, what, what are the issues involved with the animals? How the animals are inter interacting with one another? And what are the environmental properties? Fine. So the organism and its habitat. Fine. Organism and its habitat. That is what basically we are looking at. And we are look when we look at the organism, we try to find out. Say, uh, why is it that the organism population is going down? How is it that the organism is interacting with other organisms and so on? Now, what comes out of this? is basically information, fine? So research, wildlife research, gives us information that if something is wrong, wh what is wrong and why is it that it is wrong? <coughs> now, what to do with the information, fine? The information is passed on to the society. The information is passed on to the society and it goes into the education of the society. Fine. When we say education, education here is carried out basically by non-formal or informal means. Fine. Say, uh, people, if they get interested in a particular issue, what they will do is that they'll start writing articles in the newspapers. Fine. They'll start discussions within themselves. They will start post posting issues on Facebook, etc. They will start uh, seminars. There will be workshops on the issue, fine. And all these things will be dependent on economics. Say people discuss about the practical practicability of an issue. Say all information that is coming from wildlife research, it is not necessary that, that it will see the light of the day or it will be turned into reality in terms of conservation. Now, if the economics, if the economic condition at that time is not very good, then as much education as you give, it is not going to lead to a public policy. However, if economics is strong enough, people have been educated enough, people have been made aware about a situation, uh, made aware about the necessity of a situation, then we, what we have is a very strong public policy. And this public policy is again affected by history and culture. <clears throat> Say, if we take the case of Assam, so we have a very long history of conserving the rhino. Fine. So people get very easily attached to the issues of conservation. And then the Assamese culture is very vivid about examples. There are many examples. Uh, of the of the intimation or, or the intimacy of Assamese culture or culture of Assam with nature. We get many, many examples of that. So history and culture of a particular region, they also have a major role to play in framing the public policy that ultimately, what will public do? Public will go and press the government. And what government will do is that it will pass a legislation. Fine. I'll, I'm going to give you one or two practical examples uh, of uh, regarding the entire process in Assam after we go through it. Now, once the legislation is there, next comes the issue of administration. Just having a law is not going to help. What we need to do is that we need to administer a particular area for wildlife conservation. 
there in comes the management sector now management sector in assam or with with reference to india we might say that we are talking of the forest department so what will the administrators do will go for management of wildlife fine laws may be there but they need to be enforced fine administration administration may come forward but public need to see whether the whether what they want to achieve is being enforced or not and that is why enforcement is given at the boundary of the management sector and socio economic sector fine <coughs> public initially does its part fine a legislation comes into place so administrators start playing their role find that suppose a particular area is declared as a protected area and wildlife management starts but then people come to know that the way the management had to be done that is not being done so again the public they may they may enforce the administrators to go about conservation in a proper manner beyond that what happens is the wildlife management part the forest department when it starts its process it will again draw information original information which was given by the scientific sector or the researchers and what are we going to basically manage we are going to manage the habitat and we will be talking about management of the <coughs> management of the animal population so uh, if we talk about examples say there are many with reference to assam one is the case of dipur bill so it was after the ecology department uh, was established under dr professor pc bhattacharjee that researchers started carrying out bird census on dipur bill fine once it was it it, it was once people got to know that it has got a very high bird diversity that information was 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 given to the public and it is today because of the public pressure that dipur bill has been has been declared as a ramsar wetland site and it has been proposed as a wildlife sanctuary or bird sanctuary in assam there is another case say again associated with the same ecology department researchers under the guidance of pc bhattacharjee who were working at that time uh, discovered or spotted golden langur for the first time in chakrasila reserve forest fine the information was given to the public as a result uh, ngos were formed and those ngos played a role in getting chakrasila reserve forest converted into a wildlife sanctuary so this is a very very practical process now this was proposed by by uh delhi in 1984 and uh, we still find that the process operates in more or less the same manner today definitely one new factor has come in that is ngos and they are playing a role in each of the sectors so suppose if we talk about aranya i mean the scientific ngo in india uh, uh, of india of, or one of the best ngos working in the case of wildlife fine so they have projects wherein do where, where in they do research on wildlife they yield the information they work at the society level fine to raise the consciousness of the people and they also help to a certain extent in the wildlife management uh, at the management level by giving aid aid to the forest guards by giving uh, aid to the wildlife department and also by running specialized courses for management of wildlife fine for the forest staff and so on so this is the overall process that we talk about of the wildlife conservation according to Delhi. Now, so what we have done is that we have tried to explain wildlife conservation as a social process. Fine. 
so it emphasizes the historical development of attitudes fine say attitudes toward white towards wildlife conservation do not come in a day and uh, being a social process the development of attitude towards wildlife conservation definitely has a historical context fine and practices in relation to the uses and aims to integrate public and professional opinions and activities in meeting the desired ob 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 objects or aims of conservation <clears throat> so basically layman has to be made conscious fine unless and until that is done only managing wildlife in the forests is not going to be successful fine around the around the nature reserve the areas there that we have there we go for eco development work fine that is also basically to make the people conscious towards the conservation of wildlife so it is a integrated process where both the common people as well as the people who are professionals are involved together in conserving and management of wildlife now interestingly many problems of conservation turn out on close, close examination to be not technical problems that is the main issue that is they are actually problems of economics and sociology wildlife habitat today is coming under increased pressure from the growing demand of croplands that is why people are clearing more and more forests fine right? and croplands are necessary to meet the needs of ever growing human population fine right? so it is a question of demand and supply so human population is increasing there is a need for more food and need for more food uh, presses people to cut down the forests fine right? and convert them into into croplands in many instances of wildlife conservation we do not need a great insight to discover why a population is declining and what needs to be done fine if not immediately practicable or at least theoretically specifiable in certain cases although the practice may be a bit difficult at the moment but we are able to pinpoint the causes as to why a population is declining basically of population pressure fine and theoretically at least we can specify as to what needs to be done what needs to be done in order to achieve the desired goals the main difficulty lies in persuading people to take appropriate action right so that is the main issue with wildlife conservation that is we need to persuade people we need to interact with people we need to raise their consciousness and only after that is achieved can the process of wildlife conservation uh, become a success and a reality objectives of wildlife conservation to conserve the genetic resources so conservation we try to conserve the gene pools right if we ensure that the gene pools are conserved in an appropriate manner they are not polluted they are not contaminated then only can we ensure that evolution is taking place in a normal manner say for example uh, there are wild buffaloes in kaziranga national park and on the side of the kaziranga national park towards the shore areas towards the brahmaputra we have the kutis now these buffaloes are feral in nature basically and they are known to known to interbreed with the wild buffaloes of kaziranga national park if that goes on happening for a long time then definitely the gene pool of the wild buffaloes inside kmp will get contaminated to a certain extent so we need to conserve the genetic resources to gain material benefit from wildlife this we have talked about so we are not talking of directly killing the wildlife no that is not allowed in india material benefit in terms of the whole ecosystem conservation and the services if we conserve the whole ecosystem there are lot many services which ecosystems provide to us fine and along with that our tourism generates a lot of revenue to reduce material damage from wildlife now that has become a big issue today that is man animal conflict and how uh, do we manage it 
how do we go about it that is reduce the man animal conflict so that the damage from wildlife is reduced that is one also one of the main objectives of wildlife conservation to restore degraded wildlife ecosystems in their natural state if certain areas have been degraded fine so we need to restore them in their natural state so that we can uh, so that the wildlife flourishes there once again so that is what we are trying to do in manas national park today say during the social unrest period earlier uh, the entire rhinoceros population was wiped out and now we are trying to reintroduce uh, say uh, rhinos out there uh, so that the ecosystem thrives once again to regulate and improve socio economic practices of societies affecting wildlife areas fine so uh, we need to make the society aware and the socio economic property socio economic practices of the societies must be just must be must be conducive to the practice of conservation that is what we need to regulate and improve so these are the basic objectives of wildlife conservation now wildlife management i am going to take up the definition given by cogley fine uh, he finds that there are three main issues in population management of wildlife first is conservation conservation is what treatment of small or declining or ecologically extinct population in order to raise its density now the question of now when we talk of extinction extinction basically is of three main types there are many other types which have been delineated but uh, for the time being three types will do biological extinction fine say dinosaurs one time they were present on planet earth but today no longer found so they are biologically extinct second is regional extinction say cheetah at one time it was found in india today it is extinct from india it is restricted to the african zone and ecological extinction for that we need to understand as to what we mean by ecology now we define ecology very simply as the relationship between animal and its environment organisms and its environment what it means to say is that organisms they they affect the environment and if the the environment in turn produces a effect on the animals and plants right so that is what ecology is say so on one hand we have the organisms and the second hand we have the environment and there is a relationship between the organisms and the environment so what we mean to say is that say the organisms uh, affect the environment and the environment in turn affects the organisms now somehow if the population of a particular particular species goes down falls down what happens is that it loses the capacity to affect the environment and it comes to lie at the mercy of the environment fine that is when we call a particular population to be threatened fine that we are going to talk of in a different lecture as to what are, what do we mean by threatened species fine so if the population comes to lie at the mercy of the environment then the process of ecology definitely is no longer operating because the organism is unable to modify the environment to suit its own purposes in that context it is sometimes said that the population has become ecologically extinct and what we need to do is that in conservation we need to raise its density to a level that the interaction against again builds up second is sustained yield harvesting this is not practiced in india say the exploitation of a population to take from it a sustained yield fine say <clears throat> suppose we plant uh, uh, say oryza sativa rice in one acre of plot when the rice is mature we we, uh, we we harvest the rice from the entire area that is known as harvesting in botany suppose we have around 25 deer in one particular area and if we kill all the 25 deer that definitely is not harvesting so basically the concept of harvesting is different uh, in zoology as compared to that of botany and what is sustained in harvesting that we will come to in details 
when we talk about the concept of carrying capacity. Control the treatment of population that is too dense or which has an unacceptable high rate of increase to stabilize or reduce its density. <coughs> if you have uh, uh, heard my earlier lecture where I talked about uh, wildlife and the concept of wildlife and biodiversity, there, there in, uh, we mentioned that uh, we, we discussed basically that uh, Wildlife Protection Act has six schedules and uh, schedule five consists uh, the vermins vermins basically rats mice and these animals they may become economically hazardous to mankind if their population increases so what we need to do is that we need to reduce the population we are not allowed to kill them totally outrightly or make them extinct no that is not allowed but we control the population we bring down the population to a particular level so that the economic hazard goes away but the populations are still surviving because each and every species has got a role to play in nature. <coughs> so, uh, if we go according to Cogley, then conservation means increasing the population, sustained yield harvesting, we'll discuss when we talk about carrying capacity, taking a particular population, a particular numbers from a population, killing a particular numbers from, from a population in a particular year, and control is bringing down the population, uh, bringing down the population numbers which are unacceptable to us. Right? So this is the basic concept of wildlife. <coughs> Further reading, say so basically I have referred to two books, Principles of Wildlife Management by Daly and Cogley, Analysis of Vertebrate Population. In addition, you can go through two books of mine uh, one is one published Ecology All India Edition published by Kalyani Publishers. In 2019, I have a book on principles of ecology, uh, CBCS Assam edition, that is also by Kalyani Publishers. For feedback, so you can mail me, fine, or you can tweet me at Myosort. Now, Myosort <coughs> basically is the name, uh, my, my Twitter handle. The name is myosote and myosote, myosote basically is the name of a plant and it basically means forget me not. So if you have appreciated our presentation, please like, please subscribe, fine. And uh, thank you very much.